why we're doing this. Um, so for us, it's really important that founders understand and get to know uh, sources for funding at their earliest stages. And beyond thinking about institutional capital, what are other ways that founders can, can get funding to capitalize their businesses? Um, working with Grasshopper as well is awesome. The goal was really for us to think through uh, subject level experts as well as people in the space that made sense to share their experiences um, as you guys all navigate the same journeys. So in terms of upcoming events, we are wrapping things up for a bit with this current, um, with this current series and taking some time to really think about what's next in terms of what the topics are that founders want to understand and explore, as well as the folks who are, who are best suited to kind of share that knowledge with them. So after this event, we're going to be circulating uh, a survey with feedback, and we welcome your feedback. Is, uh, there's funding sources that you want to explore, questions about certain areas, um, of capital or types of capital that you have questions about, and we're going to use that insight into crafting our next event series. A little bit about Grasshopper, and I'll be brief. Uh, Grasshopper is a nationally chartered digital first business bank, and so what that basically means is we bank innovative companies such as all the amazing founders that are on the call today, as well as the venture capital and private equity firms that invest in them. Um, we're a team built by founders, for founders, and we seek to help our clients, not just on banking, but really beyond banking, so that they can have more money in the bank. And then quickly about Awesome. Uh, so Awesome is a membership organization designed to increase equity in the technology industry um, with a focus on underrepresented founders and operators. It's really about connecting founders to the knowledge and the capital that they need so that their companies can go further faster. So with that being said, um, I'm excited to introduce everyone to our panelists. Uh, I will let everyone introduce the, themselves, uh, but love to kick off with you, Kristen, if you could give a little about your background as well as uh, Envision. Yeah, uh, well, first off, thank you so much for having me. Really excited to be here to represent Envision. Uh, so my name is Kristen. I am a rising senior at Brown University. I've been a founder myself for a few ventures. Um, I study computer science and I'm an engineer. Um, I work with Envision, which is the first student-led, student-built uh, startup accelerator uh, of its kind. We're a virtual accelerator that is just finishing up its first cohort right now. We are a group of nine recently graduated or still uh, students in college or business school with the goal of diversifying the entrepreneurship landscape by supporting founders early. Uh, there's lots of founders that we know are underrepresented founders that are often overlooked and we give them access to capital and mentorship to really increase their odds of making it to the next step in the venture space. Awesome, Greta, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. That's so cool. I want to learn more about that. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not a student. I could have totally uh, used that back in the day. Um, my name is Greta. Um, I am one of the co-founders of Blue Fever. And Blue Fever is on a mission to create an online space for teenage girls that increases belonging, builds resilience, and reduces overwhelm. Uh, we've done this initially with 350,000 Gen Z uh, girls to date, ages 13 to 20, over a text message product. Um, and soon we are launching to an app that we are calling Emotional Media, Not Social Media. And in terms of accelerators, um, I have participated in two with my company, Blue Fever. Um, one was Techstars LA, uh, and it was in 2017 when we were initially getting started with this version of the company, and they supported us through a really interesting pivot. Happy to talk about that more. And then we just finished another program um, with Amazon's Alexa Fund uh, just last week. So I'm fresh out of it, and uh, two very different experiences, um, you know, based on different uh, stages of our company. Awesome. And we have one last panelist. Do you like to choose yourself? Yeah. Hi, Denise. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Cool. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Micah Koch, and I'm the managing director for Urban X. Uh, we are the accelerator for startups reimagining city life. Um, I am part of a small group uh, within BMW. 
and work with uh, the mini brand to run this uh, program that's really focused and has been for the last four and a half years or so um, on helping founders from all around the world who are building more efficient, more livable, more enjoyable cities. Um, we run the program with a venture partner called Urban Us. Uh, we built a portfolio of about 57 uh, teams from all around the world. And um, uh, before that, I was the, uh, the founding uh, director of innovation and entrepreneurship at NYU School of Engineering. So I have some experience working with, uh, with student entrepreneurs. I also do some work with the National Science Foundation uh, on commercializing deep tech. Um, and uh, excited to be here uh, in this challenging and historic time. Yes, awesome. Thank you guys so much. Uh, so the, the first question I'll ask, uh, and the question I guess that's on everyone's mind today is how COVID-19 has uh, impacted your respective programs. Um, so kind of thinking about Envision Urban X, kind of just would love to hear how you guys have pivoted um, or what's changed uh, about the program. Uh, and then uh, Greta would love to hear as you went through the Alexa Accelerator, kind of how that experience was, uh, especially in comparison to Techstars LA, given that you did it in person. Yeah, happy to kick off with that one. Uh, I think we're in a little bit of a different place than some of the other accelerators out there in the sense that we really did start um, partly because of COVID and um, a lot of because of the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. So part of how Envision started, uh, me and a few of my friends from Brown um, and then some of our friends from different schools across the country had really been talking to each other casually about lots of resources out there about how to educate yourself, how to, how to donate, how to talk to local representatives. And we really thought, all of those things are great, but how can we make a difference? And how can we make a difference in a space that we're uniquely positioned to do so? So we decided, uh, like I mentioned, capital and mentorship are two of the most important assets that founders can have. So the beginning of June, we started uh, Envision. We set the application up and got it up and running in about three weeks. And then we've been running the cohort for the last eight. And so how COVID affects us really goes more to the future than the past. Um, we're running another cohort this fall to really capitalize on the fact that a lot of students are deciding to take gap years. Lots of entrepreneurs are deciding to work on their companies full time, given that they, they don't think that the existing, the previous landscapes make as much sense uh, with COVID in place. So we're really trying to capitalize on, on those sorts of trends to support entrepreneurs as they navigate this difficult time. Awesome, Michael, would you like to go next? Sure, I mean, I think for anyone um, who is considering an accelerator, and, and by the way, like I, I think it's helpful to start with a definition of terms, right? So, um, you know, generally speaking, the way that, um, you know, that, that I think most people will define an accelerator is a, is a program that actually invests capital uh, in teams, um, uh, in exchange for equity or debt at an early stage. Um, I think a lot, there are a lot of great programs out there that don't invest um, any capital, but it's a, I think it's a different situation. Um, and I would generally refer to those programs as like incubators. Uh, and so I, I think you think about a spectrum of like programs that are really, really hands-on um, and programs that are not. And then I think there's another kind of dynamic at play as to whether or not it's a mentor led program versus a partner led program. Um, so, you know, I think I guess building on what Kristen said, you know, in, in terms of what the value proposition is um, for that experience and, and in exchange for giving up equity and taking uh, investors money. Um, you know, the way that we think about that is, is kind of three legs of, of a stool. So the first is very much focused on, customer development. And, and so that, that really is about, you know, traditional, um, you know, lean startup, customer development, customer discovery, making sure that you're building the right thing and that you, you actually have, have built a, a business model that is scalable and repeatable, right? One where there's positive unit economics, you really understand your channel economics, go to market and you're able to demonstrate some traction. And I think in, you know, many ways, this is part of the, the value prop of like Alexa fund and the work that I do as well. Um, is getting people in touch with customers. The second part 
um, for us is around product development. So it's a really hands-on program where we offer a thousand hours of help to each team um, to help them build their product. It's UX, UI, software development, you know, electrical, mechanical engineering, design, et cetera. Um, and then the third is around fundraising. Um, and that's not just like, okay, it's demo day, you know, here's your deck, but it's really, how do you run a successful fundraising process? And arguably that process has actually changed um, since COVID. So um, from our perspective, I think, you know, the, the main change is, you know, it's a remote program now, whereas it, it did not used to be. And that has changed, I think, some of the collegiality of like what it means to actually have a cohort because entrepreneurship is hard, right? It's, it's lonely and there are times where it sucks um, and it's a roller coaster and it's really nice to have, you know, a shoulder to cry on or someone to, you know, build with and, and that physical experience of, of having a cohort work together in the same space, very difficult to replicate on Zoom. I think the other area is, again, for like the teams who are building, um, uh, you know, a, a physical device. And I would say about, you know, 30, 35% or so of our teams have some hardware or connected, um, you know, uh, material thing. You know, th that digital fabrication experience is, again, challenging to do if you're not in the same room as someone. Um, and so currently, like, that's happening in parallel with teams. Um, and then just lastly, on the fundraising thing, so it's interesting, like a lot of investors are writing checks without actually meeting people in person. I don't think that's the biggest thing. I think it's a question of, um, you know, what industry you're in and, and then ultimately, again, like running a process where you're going to, you know, you're, you're probably going to have at least 100, 120 investor touch points before you're able to close your round. So I think just the uncertainty of where we are at this time and place means that there's just a lot of folks who say they're open for business, but who are really like just beginning to peek out from underneath the table. Um, and so it's like calibrating expectations appropriately. And then again, running a fully virtual fundraise process, um, which is again, just inherently different from um, what was happening a few months ago. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mike, I resonate with a lot of what you're saying from a founder perspective. Um, having done my first accelerator in 2017, pre-COVID, um, it was all in person and we definitely felt like a cohort, right? Like you're in person, you have those like asynchronous moments, those moments like you when you do actually literally cry on someone's shoulder or you lean over and you say, hey, I need help with this or what are your thoughts? I think that when you're in a remote program, which um, this, this one that we did uh, this past summer was, uh, with Alexa, it's just a bit harder to have um, those serendipitous moments and to also build relationship. Um, you know, all of the companies in my 2017 program were in person. Not all of them were from Los Angeles, but they came here and made the commitment to be here for the three, three-ish months. Um, and we really created uh, bonds that are still super strong to this day. I mean, I feel like I can pick up the phone and call anybody any hour, at any time, asking them the questions that only other founders would know, right, and have been through. And so that was incredibly invaluable. Um, with this uh, Alexa cohort, they did a tremendous job of, uh, of handling it all being remote, especially because there were, I think, seven companies and we were across nine different time zones. So it made it really difficult for us to have any kind of hangout relationship building time because by the time our sessions were done, we had morning sessions. I'm on the West Coast and so morning my time, you know, it was 10 p.m. their time. They'd already had a full day of work. So they're not going to want to hang around for happy hour um, <laughs> at 10 p.m., 11 p.m. at night. Um, and so I think that uh, that uh, that made it different. And, you know, there were definitely benefits to it. I think that uh, I'm really grateful that this program was remote for the stage of company that we are now. We're, we're later stage than we were. And so we have a lot more on our plates, a lot more that we have to do outside of the program. Um, you know, but ultimately, I think I think the Alexa Next Stage program did a phenomenal job of being respectful of our time, um, but also making things run incredibly smoothly. I just think that the relationship component, um, you know, the serendipitous relationship component was missing. And that's something that I, um, 
you know, wish we had had, but I'm looking forward to the future when I go to Estonia and I meet uh, an Israel and I meet <laughs> the founders who I spent a lot of time on Zoom with. So it just gives us all something to look forward to when we actually get to meet in person um, when it's safe. Totally. And Greta, that's a great segue for, for our next question. Um, and curious what, what you think about this as well, Micah. Kind of, I think there's a gray area for founders sometimes in understanding what the relationship looks like when you're working with an accelerator that has a corporate um, corporate backing. And so uh, a lot of times founders equate these accelerators or accelerators with corporate backing to kind of corporate venture um, and either think that they are, you know, uh, want to see their company so they can poach it or duplicate it. Uh, how would you suggest founders kind of think through and, and diligence the role of um, a corporate and an accelerator? I can yeah. hop in. Oh, go ahead, Micah. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very, I'll be very, very brief. I mean, I think, you know, number one, um, the, the best way to diligence uh, a, a program or really any investor uh, is to talk to to other founders who um, have worked with that investor again, regardless of I think the stage uh, of the company. So I think that you know that kind of answers that the, the question around diligence for me is really about like speaking to other founders. Um, you know, with respect to the corporate question, it's it's really interesting. So you know, I I've been um, in tech for a while, and I used to have a lot more hair, and less of it was gray. Um, but, you know, corporates have gone earlier and earlier and earlier. And, um, you know, they are not, I mean, I think maybe there's some exceptions to the rule, but most corporates are not looking to um, steal your business idea. They're not looking to M&A uh, with you. They are looking at culture change. They're look, looking for help kind of seeing around corners. Um, and if they're smart, they're looking at ways that they can actually work with you in order to, um, you know, improve their business. So, you know, BMW is a great example. Like they, there's not one approach to the startup community. Um, there's, there's multiple. So they have um, the corporate venture fund. They have, you know, Urban X, which is, which is earlier stage. Um, and they have a program called BMW Startup Garage, um, which is an equity free, you know, we'll buy your proof of concept, help get you a supplier ID. And so it's really finding ways to kind of work within that supply chain so that the corporate can actually be a customer because um, revenue is better than equity. And that's, I'll say that twice because I think it's really important, like revenue is better than equity. Um, and, um, and, and so they're doing that in the hope again of, you know, finding ways that they can solve existing business needs for the company and also expand to the future markets and, and build, um, you know, their, their product viability. So if they're smart, again, they're going to engage in an appropriate way. It's really, it, that's challenging though. I think in most, most large corporates, it's very difficult to um, bridge that gap and, and to identify the right kinds of people who, um, you know, who are going to be your advocate, who are going to help you again, um, you know, get into the, uh, into the supply chain um, and help introduce you to, to expansion opportunities. Yeah, um, that's great. I think I would follow up with that from a founder perspective and agree that the best way to vet any type of investor, whether they're corporate or not, is to talk to other founders that they've invested in. I would also say um, something that really worked for us was being very uh, transparent about what our concerns were. There had been a lot of, uh, and, and what your needs and expectations are. So when we went into, when we were interviewing for the Alexa Next Stage program, we were, you know, had seen some press about um, Amazon, uh, our companies saying that Amazon stole their business idea. Um, there were things that were, you know, really concerning. There was news that came out during the program as well. And we um, made sure to check in with those founders and bring it up to the managing directors directly. I think that that's really powerful instead of being worried that you won't get in because you're calling something out, you know, it just shows you're a strong leader and you're defending your business. And that's the kind of founder they want to work with, ideally, if they're smart, right? Um, and, and also, you know, for us, we wanted to know what the expectations were on Amazon's side. Was Amazon expecting that we would change our product roadmap and create an integration with them over the next eight weeks? Um, you know, was that a necessary, you know, part of the experience? And, uh, you know, because 
because we were concerned we are going to be launching an app this fall and we thought oh my gosh if we have to go you know create something else that's that's not in the best interest of blue fever and so we directly addressed that and uh, ultimately the answer that we got was um one, you know, you don't have to create an integration. It's an option, but it's eight weeks. And we realize that those eight weeks aren't necessarily the best um, for your roadmap. So that was great. Um, two, they were very clear that we didn't need to share any data uh, product insights that we didn't want to, um, which was comforting. And, and three, that they were, doing, they were doing a lot of extra vetting to make sure that scenarios that had happened with previous companies um, you know, feeling like, oh, you know, they stole our business idea, X, Y, Z, after they invested. Uh, one of the things we were told uh, was that they were doing extra vetting and there was like probably like 14 calls that we were on with different departments um, to make sure that nobody was working on the idea that we were working on um, because it doesn't make sense to cannibalize. And I appreciated that thoughtfulness because um, that hadn't been done in the past. And I think that that was some of the problems when you get to, when you're with such a large organization, a large company, yeah. like, Amazon, right? Like they don't, it's not always malicious. Maybe I, I can't speak if it's, if it is or not, but there, there's a lot going on. So you won't necessarily know everything that every department's working on. Yeah. So I think um, my takeaways are just, you know, talk to the other founders and then be really transparent about your needs and put your needs first. Um, and I think that, you know, ultimately we found that that could work for us and got a lot of benefit being in a corporate environment like Amazon, having that, um, you know, peak in there of like, okay, what, it, what is it like? Um, and uh, it gave us it like kind of a, a greater vantage point for Blue Totally. Fever. Super helpful. Kristen, I'd love to kind of shift gears and, and talk about student founders um, and kind of this climate for entrepreneurship for, for student founders overall. Um, of course, with colleges all over the world trying to figure out what they're trying to do, you're seeing more uh, students deciding to take a gap year um, or, you know, use this time to, to build and create. Uh, I wanted to, one, kind of understand and based off your experience right now with Envision, learn a little bit more about what the cohort looks like in terms of what the student founders have decided to do. I'm sure you have folks working on their idea full time or of course doing a hybrid as they're in school. Um, and then we have a few student founders in, in the chat that are trying to actively think through this now um, and what advice you would give for student founders trying to navigate whether they should take a gap year um, and would be able to do an accelerator in tandem with going to school. Yeah, totally. So first, just to give a little bit of a, a background on what our cohort looks like, we have 17 companies in our first cohort. Um, and Greta resonated with me when you were talking about time zones. So we specifically indicated uh, when people applied that we wanted students or founders between Pacific and Eastern time on the United States. So people in <laughs> any of the Americas, essentially, because uh, we were overwhelmed enough with the idea of working on this virtually. So that is something different. Y Combinator, Techstars, a lot of the big companies have written a lot about how they transition to demo day, virtual, that sort of thing, especially as it happened in March, right when the pandemic hit. Um, it's kind of a blessing and a curse that we never had the experience in person. So uh, honestly, I've only met one of the nine of the founding team members in person with Envision, which is actually uh, really cool that we have started to figure out how to meet new people and find this kind of community that we were looking for in the virtual space. Um, and like you mentioned, Greta, with the, the Amazon Accelerator, we did work really hard to try to help find that community. And that's also why we were pretty specific about having people at least relatively on the same time zone. Um, and then in terms of, the, there's the 17, uh, we have a pretty even split of male and female founders, a pretty even split of black, Latinx, Asian, and white founders, and then uh, most of our founders are in their early 20s, so having recently graduated from over 40 different universities, and um, most of them are recent undergraduates, but we do have two of the 17 teams that are run by uh, MBA students who have either recently graduated or are still in school. So there's a few cool things there that we just never anticipated of we were assuming undergraduate because most of us are undergraduates, but it's been cool to see the difference um, that that being in grad school can make in terms of the the connections they have, the different types of mentorship that they need, the different the different support that we can give them. And then, um, in terms of 
students looking to take gap years, looking to start on um, working on companies, we do have, we are helping our students actually navigate these choices in a lot of cases because some people are thinking about going back, maybe their co-founders aren't, what does that mean in terms of raising? And I think this is something we've learned a lot about as we are going into demo day and having our companies raise is how do investors look at companies who aren't full-time yet? They're usually less keen to invest in a company because there doesn't seem to be that conviction from the founders. If they're not working on it full-time, why would an investor want to put their money towards you? And that's one nuance that we've been really thinking a lot about from a diverse founder perspective of having the ability to not go back to school, having the ability to work full-time on something is a privilege in a lot of cases. Some people have parents to support them financially. Uh, one example, we have a girl who's deciding whether to, or not to go back to a really high powered school and they pay for her health insurance. That's part of her, her package, her financial aid package to go to that university. And she's really keen not to go, but part of that is she needs to raise enough money where she can support herself in a number of ways that honestly, I haven't had to think of if I was gonna make that jump. So I think there's a lot of nuances here in general, but especially working with such a diverse group of students. We've been learning a lot about also how to talk to investors about, we really think you should look at this team, but they're not full time and we feel totally comfortable continuing to recommend them to you because they need this investment to make that leap, which is really the chicken and the egg problem of an investor wants you to be full time to invest, but you can't go full time until you have the investment. Um, so in terms of taking the gap year, I think similar to what Greta said about talking to investors is being extremely transparent in this difficult time of what do you need to work on your venture? What do you need to feel supported and to be most productive? Um, part of that, a lot of founders ask us, how do I talk to investors about if I'm paying myself? Because there's kind of the quintessential, I'm a founder, I'm bootstrapping, I'm gonna eat ramen noodles for five years and I, I don't need that much money. But again, a lot of people have expenses that kind of traditional investing might not have thought of. Yeah, Kristen, I think you bring up such a good point, and it's something that I think about a lot and saw in our Alexa program, where a lot of the founders were older than they were in our Techstars one, and so some of them, I don't, I don't have children uh, yet, but like some of them had families and like teenagers and people to support, and um, and when you look at diversifying the kind of you know, early stage founders and their ability to get investment, I, it really makes me angry um, when investors like, well, you're not working on this full time, so you're not committed because there are so many different factors that go into that, especially when I hear that health insurance story, um, you know, like, okay, so you want me to choose between, you know, my health um, and showing you that I'm committed. And I, I think in my experience, I found that the founders, founders, the investors who are the right fit for you will not make you make those difficult decisions that they'll say, we know that the best kind of founder is a founder who's supported and has the basic level. It's kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? That they have the basic level of support so that they, so that their output of the work, like my money's going to use because, um, you know, they're not spending half their day wigging out that they're going to, you know, end up in the ER for some reason and then be in debt, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. So I think that it found our experience. There's just so much uh, diversity. And, and even when it comes to relationship building, just different abilities for people to hang out. If you're all like, you know, 18 to 22, maybe you have more time and you don't have to like put kids to bed um, or, or have other responsibilities. So I just wanted to, to, to speak up about that because I think you brought up just such an important part that is often swept under the rug and left for founders to cope with um, on their own, which, which can be very lonely and isolating. Yeah, I, I also will say, I think it's a, I think it's a really great point. Um, we have a founder now in the, in the program who um, hasn't left his, his gig full time. Um, and you know, it's a challenge. I mean, there have been other, there have been other scenarios where like we've had other founders like max out every single credit card, you know, take out a second mortgage on their house. And it's like that belief in the vision. I mean, I, I will, I just want to say two things though. Like number one is, you know, venture may not be the right asset class for every business. And I think that in this culture, we kind of glamorize tech and startups and venture and i think there's a misunderstanding of like lp math 
like most entrepreneurs don't understand what actually winds up happening when you take venture money um, and the clock that you're on and the, and the kind of returns that, um, that that asset class is looking for. So it's not always the right um, uh, kind of money, I think, for every kind of business. I will say that what just one other point, which is like, I, I think one of the things that we try to do in terms of building really, you know, strong foundations and, and helping to shape the DNA of the teams that we work with is working on communications. And I think that, um, you know, communicating with an investor and communicating with your team and, and with customers, like it's, it's both an art and a science and it's also a learned skill. Um, and you know, I've had founders who have been in touch with me for years before they're ready to apply for urban X. Um, and so like keeping people updated and really being able to effectively communicate, you know, your progress, um, with an investor over time is an absolutely critical skill. I think that, that most accelerator programs probably should be focusing more time on. Um, because communication is just incredibly important and it doesn't, it's not like, you know, when you close your seed round or you close your A round, like that's the need for that skill goes away. Um, arguably it only gets more important. So it, I think that, you know, writing good updates essentially, uh, is, is really, um, incredibly important. I agree. And I'll just say quickly, cause I know we, I'm sure we have to move on to the next <laughs> question. I was somebody who you know, worked at my job until I felt like I could make that transition in a way that I felt comfortable. So if any founders are listening, um, know that at least what I'm, there's many of us, but I have done that as well. And um, it was the right decision for me and our investors were like, yeah, totally makes sense. Great. So it is possible. Yeah, no, I, and I think that's a great transition into applying to accelerators, right? So we have a ton of folks on here um, who I think a lot of the information that you guys all shared have been has been super helpful around thinking about what the right accelerator is for you and how to kind of navigate that said accelerator um, during these times. But uh, something that I want to talk about and really appreciated what you said, Greta, kind of around uh, your transparency with Amazon and just being upfront about about your concerns. And uh, Mike, are you sharing that you know someone in your cohort is still working full time? Like I think that uh, founders sometimes, and I'd be curious what both Mike and Kristen are seeing. Like the first time you meet these companies uh, is at the time of application. Um, whereas, uh, of course, I think we can never understate the importance of building relationships and people seeing how companies evolved over time or where the companies got to. Um, but, but would really love if Mike and Kristen, you guys could kind of share what things stood out or what were helpful as you guys look and assess uh, at applications. And then Greta, what are some of the things that you do when applying to accelerators that you think help stand out um, and also just helps you with the process in general? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to start off with that one. So this is definitely unique to Envision, but one of the, the main criteria we have are the demographics and the diversity of the founding team. So we, we do put it in our application that a majority of the founding team has to either be a woman and or a person of color, um, ideally underrepresented founders, uh, because that is the biggest part of Envision's mission. We want to help see those up underrepresented founders get access to the resources that so many people have been lucky to kind of fall into. Um, and to Greta's point, a lot of that is serendipitous. Um, I have the job I currently have because I met someone through a family friend and babysat for their kids. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that I was lucky enough to be raised in a, a place that has lots of other people working in tech and working in startups. Um, so making it so that we work with the community aspect, we get people randomly on Zooms to say, oh, I worked here and I knew this person. And, we really realized that it's it's a small world, which is both a, a good and a bad thing in a way. A lot of people know each other, but also it shows us kind of how insular it is. Um, and a lot of that is also looking for founders who are willing to, to really engage, because we like to say you get out of Envision what you put into it. Um, people who are, are interested in building the community with the other founders who are interested in getting to know the teammates at Envision, the, the mentors really building those relationships, because it's not like we want to just help you make more friends. We, we understand how valuable those relationships are down the road. And then from a more kind of uh, usual look at uh, founders, we are really focused on people who are passionate about the problems they're solving, are going after big problems to solve, 
are uniquely positioned. And that's one thing we found is really interesting coming from diverse founders is how many problems they, they experience themselves or through their communities or through their different backgrounds that many people wouldn't even understand or be able to tackle given that they're not from these diverse backgrounds. So uh, one example of this, we have a really awesome company working to help low income families optimize their food stamps. So SNAP benefits uh, are supposed to cover $2.50, I think is the statistic that um, organizations put out for how much a meal in the United States costs. And uh, the current average staff benefit is only $1.40. So we have two founders who at some point in their lives have both been on food stamps who really understand this problem and are working to implement technology to help families across the United States put these benefits uh, to the, the amount they really need. So that's just one example that I love to use about um, there is a double bottom line. We work a lot with double bottom line companies of how can you make a social impact while also making money? How can you really tell that story to investors that it's not just for social good, but you can really do both at the same time? And how can they use their unique experiences in the right way to, to make an impact on both of those scales? So yeah, definitely diversity, passion, big problems, and a real interest and curiosity to engage with the community that we've worked really hard to build. That was a, that's a great answer. That's, that's very difficult to follow. Um, I, you know, I think it's, it's many of the things that you said, I, I will say, um, I think people who invest at the early stage are generally looking to mitigate three kinds of risk. Um, so they're looking to mitigate kind of product or technology risk. Um, they're looking to mitigate um, market or timing risk, and I think they're trying to mitigate team risk. Um, and so, you know, arguably of those three, and it's, it's very difficult to do, like this is the hardest part of what we do is team selection, um, because you're trying to get signal, right? And, or some like good housekeeping stamp of approval. Someone who's, you know, smarter um, than us who said, yeah, like there's, there's a there there and there's, there's something like that's really interesting there. And that could be, again, technical validation. It could be market validation and customers and traction, like the market saying, yeah, this is, this is cool. I'd pay for this. Um, or from a team perspective, you know, um, to Kristen's point, like, yeah, those are the people who really know that problem and they fall in love with the problem. And I think a lot of times that's, um, one of the things that, is uh, is an issue is people are more in love with their solution than they are with the problem um but it's it's very very difficult and um you know i'll just say i think like the thing to help make your application stand out is you know really deeply um you know living with and understanding the problem that you're trying to solve being able to quantify it i think i saw a question of like how big does the opportunity need to be I mean, it, it, it needs to be, again, venture scale. So it, I think for us, like it has to be, you know, both capable of being a hundred million dollar a year business um, and also um, scaling to a hundred cities over the next, you know, two to five years. Cause we're really trying to focus on, you know, climate decarbonization and resilience. So we don't have a whole lot of time um, in order to scale these big solutions. So um yeah, like I say, a lot of times, you know, the product will change, revenue model and business model will change. What generally doesn't change are the people. Um, so it is, you know, about the, the team, I think, that's, that's working on solving this big problem. And then their insights, they're really specific and, and unique insights around go to market, um, how they're going to acquire customers, and then again, traction and, and any kind of proof points that shows that you know, customers really care enough to pay or refer other customers or what have you. Yeah, and I would just say from the founder perspective, all both of your answers are are wonderful and I think have a lot of gems in there um, for founders who want to apply to accelerators. I think two things that really um, have helped us as we've applied to accelerators is one, really having a good story. Because um, in the early stage, you know, people are investing in you. 
because like Micah said, your business model could change, your product could change. We are like living proof of that. Each accelerator we go into, like we have a different product when we come out of it. Um, this one was just a bit more intentional, but um, in our first one, we were initially an SVOD platform for millennial women curated by Mood, and we came out a text message product. So obviously they didn't invest in the product, but they invested in our, my co-founder and I's potential to innovate and to pivot and to um, really, you know, believe in this vision so much that we knew the what, we just had to figure out the how. Um, so I think that really having a strong story that, that you are very clear on what your North Star is, you are clear on what you are solving. Um, I would also make sure that they know that you're coachable. And I say that um, not like, you know, I, I say that in a very like meaningful way. It's like, you know, don't try to put on a, um, put on airs or pretend you're just like, oh, I'll take whatever advice you give me, but like show that you are, have the ability to take in information, process it, and, um, and really be thoughtful about it. Um, I think being coachable is, is huge as a founder and uh, just being kind of open enough um, and closed enough at the same time where you're sticking to your vision, but you're making sure to, to take in um, the wisdom of others and parse that out. Um, and then the third thing, I think I'm on three things, is, you know, any connections that you have, uh, you know, are always su super valuable. We are humans at the end of the day. Like we are relationship oriented beings. So, um, you know, people, are, everybody's always trying to mitigate risk in startups. So if one of your investor knows the MD of a program, if you, you know, have your best friend's aunt's dog walker who knows them, like try to make that connection. It doesn't matter if they're a fancy tech connection or not. People are trying to get to know you. And if you remember that you as a founder are really what they're vetting um, and the and the commitment to your vision, then it's, it's getting people to de-risk that like you're the kind of person that they want to work with. Um, and we found that that worked really well in um, getting into both of these accelerators and, uh, you know, happy to talk to anybody offline. Um, being a connector is one of my superpowers and um, I'm, I'm happy to, to share any wisdom with that. Yeah, really quick, I'd just like to add, I really uh, like the point you made about coachability, and that's something we find is especially important with young first-time founders, because we get a lot of questions about, as a 21-year-old who just graduated, how do I convince investors in Silicon Valley that I'm the person to do this, that they should give me lots of money? Um, what kind of credibility do I have? And I think we work a lot with founders about the balance, like you mentioned, between conviction and humility of having the humility to say, I don't know, or we're still working through that, or we think this is our initial customer, but we're still finding product market fit. I think there's a lot of, of work to be done to really find that balance with your team, with yourself, with your company about, about how to have those conversations of what you do and don't know and when that's okay to admit. Yeah, one of my investors once told me, and I, I love it, I, I, and I've used it a lot, is investors don't expect you to have the answers, and I think that's the mistake that first-time founders make. I surely did, because um, you don't. You don't have the answer. But they're looking for your framework of thinking. How do you think through problems? Because if you're able to think through problems, then you're going to be able to get through um, anything that comes at you, right? Because it's not just uh, you know your ability to lead a team, but it's your ability to deal with something like COVID. How are you going to think through that? How are you going to think through the unexpected? Um, so just remember, it's about your thought process, not you having all the answers, which hopefully gives you a relief um, that you don't have to know everything. And, and quite frankly, no one knows everything. Everything. And with that, we're going to open it up to a question. So, uh, Jennifer, I know you had a question. You can go first. Hi everyone, can you guys hear me well? Cool. Um, thank you guys for this webinar. I have a quick question. How do you navigate the process of applying to accelerators when what you're building isn't necessarily understood by those in decision making power? For me specifically, I'm building a tech solution that allows women to more easily purchase a wig. And so what I find oftentimes is I have a great application, I have you know a bit of traction, I recently won a pitch competition, but unfortunately either the people in the power are men so they, they don't have that issue, or if they are women, they've never actually gone through the, per the process of pur purchasing a wig either, so I feel like my application still kind of falls on deaf ears. Yeah, I can speak to that as a founder. Um, I've had the same problem, probably not as, in, as intense as you, but 
Here's one of the things that's really worked for us because I've been told by investors multiple times um, and, and other accelerators we've applied to previously as well. Like, I, I think what you're doing is wonderful, but I just don't get it. Like, I'm not a teenage girl. Like, I just don't get it. And I think that what has helped us, and this might sound um, uh, counterintuitive, is we actually sought out mentors who were, who looked like the people in charge. So a lot of straight white men who thought like straight white men and and we said hey we want to work with you to help us tell a story that can that will make sense to people who have had your life experience and I think that you know there's two ways you could do it you could either go that route and say how do I break down the story and tell it in a way that makes sense because you're right there's a lot of translation when that's so far from their experience um, and or seek out people who are in positions of power who do who have had that experience. Now, I would assume those are few and far between. Is that correct? Who've like had a wig and who've had that problem before? Correct. Yeah, then I would say what we found has worked is find somebody who can help, who is good at storytelling and who looks and thinks like the person you're trying to convince and have them be open to being coached by them to have you tell the story to get it across. Um, does that make sense? That's actually a very interesting um, uh, idea in terms of having it translated to someone that has no clue what the market even looks like and what the process currently looks like and then how our possible solution yeah. would sort of change the process of purchasing a wig. Yeah, we've had to have multiple conversations with mentors who looked like the investors we were trying to go after and they beat us up a lot. <laughs> like it was very hard, a very hard process. But in the end, as a founder, and a spe and, and, and this is so much harder when you are um, a woman or a founder of color, um, but it's your job as a founder to make them understand, unfortunately. And good investors will try to meet you there halfway, but not all investors are like that. Yeah, so I, I think really, that's fair. I, I, yeah. I mean, I think not every, not every investor has to like feel the pain themselves in order to understand that there's a you right. know, big viable market and that you have a unique competitive advantage to like crack that market wide open. Um, you know, I like on the wig front, like my sense is, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of VCs who've never had that problem, but maybe they have a mother or a sister who's had cancer or something like that. And they've, you know, I, I, I guess my, my only point here is like, you know, like I've invested in, I've invested in a secondhand vintage um, uh, company that was started by a female woman of color. I've never bought anything secondhand vintage. I'm not her ideal customer but I think there's a really great business opportunity there. She kind of painted a picture where like she had a clear edge to, you know, to make a lot of money in that space. So I think it's, I think it's doable. And also, you know, coming back to what I said before, like realize you have to treat raising money like a sales process because that's what it is. And you're probably going to have to talk to, you know, 150, 200 investors because it's such a smaller, different niche space for them. And then there will be one, hopefully, who writes you a check, I think. And, and that's the, you know, that's the, that's the process. Um, and I think that's kind of the nature of the beast for most founders. Yeah, and this is something that we, we work a lot with at Envision, again, because we have seen that a lot of founders do go after problems that the average demographic investor hasn't necessarily faced. And that is why our cohort is uniquely positioned to do so. And I think a lot of this has to do with knowing who you're talking to. So if you know you're speaking to an investor who is a woman or a woman of color or who has been someone who has experienced needing a wig, there's a very different narrative to playing towards their empathetic side of, you know this problem, I know that you've understood this problem, imagine how much better it would be with my solution, as opposed to what Micah said is what I found with a lot of investors, especially male investors being pitched to by females working on female uh, directed companies is being very specific, like from the sales perspective of this is how big the market is and this is how much money we can make and playing a lot less to the more empathetic side of it because you know that that person just hasn't had that experience. And there will be investors like Micah who are smart investors who invest in things that they don't know personally about, but they understand the market opportunity. So 
yeah, you're just going to have to sift through them, but it's helpful to try to really target in on like whose perspective are you trying to, to get, to get to. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Nichelle asked a, a great question around how do you find the balance of selling your startup and, and being transparent? Um, of course, you always want to, you know, put your best foot forward. But I think uh, in general, people who work with founders or investing in founders are also assessing for coachability and kind of vulnerability um, as, as you communicate what you're building. So what is that balance? And maybe if it is kind of like a hard truth you're sharing, how can you frame it in a way that I think uh, still allows you to have your best foot forward? I'll keep my answer short. I think it's trial and error. I think that you have to pitch a lot of people to make this point. In our first round, we pitched over 200 investors before we closed our round. And it's, you know, it is trial and error depending on who the person is. And every time you pitch, you learn a little more, you tweak, you adjust, you tweak, you adjust, and you understand like you're never done with the pitch. You don't figure it out and then go out. It is like an ever evolving process. And so I, I think it's just trial and error depending on your, um, the problem you're solving, the sector you're in. I think there's also a difference here in terms of who you're pitching to. So we've, again, with early, really early stage companies, we have a number of ventures looking to raise from angels, which is very different from institutional pre-seed rounds versus growth stage venture. So I think one example there is angels really want to get to know you as people and they want to see that you're willing to, to have that relationship to be vulnerable with them, which might be a little bit different than getting on the phone with partners at a big institutional firm. So I think from a high level, like Greta said, um, looking for the trial and error, the patterns that match up with the different types of investors that you're speaking with. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say like, I think that it's easy to think in this, uh, in these last couple of years that like the truth doesn't matter and um, that what you say doesn't have real consequences. But I think for me personally, like integrity is probably the most important thing. And, you know, there's a great expression that says your reputation is earned in drips and lost in buckets. So I think, uh, you know, if there is a situation where like you're not telling your investor something major um, and it turns out they find out somehow or another, you know, A, it makes them, it makes it very, very difficult for them to speak to the person who's going to lead your next round and give you a good reference, right? Um, because again, like, why would we do that and ruin, you know, another relationship? Um, and I think, uh, you know, just, you know, B is, um, you know, the right, the right relationship is going to be there with you up for ups and downs. And so, you know, you want to be able to have some transparency and, um, and say when things are not going right, because uh, asking for help is important. And so for, for our last question, uh, we're going to talk about valuation. So we got a great question around how do you determine what to give, um, what equity percentage in a seed accelerator, and kind of what is the, the rule of thumb? And Greta would love to hear from your experience uh, if you were able to negotiate or, uh, at all or what that looked like. Uh, yeah, so um, I've had two different experiences. One where the initial program, um, Techstars takes uh, 6% equity um, for their like and it was we were super early stage um, so that was non-negotiable for anybody I've never heard anybody negotiate out of that it's just a hard stop um, and that was for I think the initial twenty thousand dollars I'm not sure if this has changed at all but back then and then um, they also you know offered a convertible note um, and they were willing to price that convertible note um, at whatever you valued yourself at. Uh, and so I think that initially, you know, most, ex most accelerators that I've seen are like, I think your company's worth around the one to three million mark um, is typically what's suggested. Um, we were able to negotiate uh, for the valuation we were raising on, which was higher than that. Um, so I, I think that, and in, and in Alexa, the Alexa program, it was just whatever valuation you were raising on because they're later stage companies and everybody was 
different industries and different uh, places. So I think that you know, when it comes to valuation, when you're first valuing your company, um, looking at a lot of comparables is really helpful um, and trying to figure out, uh, talk to your investors. I think initially we asked our investor what should our valuation be because usually investors set the terms. But when you're like super early stage, it might be an angel who doesn't do that. Um, and we initially set our valuation too high because someone was like, you're worth X. And we went out and people were like, nope. And then we were like, okay, maybe we're worth something else. Again, it's trial and error, um, you know, of, of, figuring, of figuring that out. Uh, so there isn't one right answer, but I would say look around and see if you can talk to other founders in your sector and go, okay, what, what did you value your company at and why and what was the logic? And it's really what the market will bear. Um, but making sure that you're not valuing yourself too high. A lot of founders I see are like, I'm going to chase this highest valuation. We look at narratives like Clubhouse and we're all like, ooh, can we get $100 million, right? Um, but that's actually pretty dangerous in the long term. So I encourage uh, because that's a high valuation to live up to, um, you know, if that's your first round out the gate. So I would encourage founders to pace themselves and look to the next round. I know that sounds crazy, but you're raising your seed or your pre-seed round, like look to your seed or series A and think, what do you, what do we think, what traction do we actually think, like honestly think we'll get? And then what valuation will that make so that you can position yourself so you don't have a down round? It's like biggest thing I'd tell you because I see a lot of people um, get too hyped on their valuations early on. Awesome. And with that, we're going to end things. I want to say a huge thank you to, to the panelists. Um, I was just talking to Yanina about how lucky we feel to have had such a great dialogue between the three of you and you guys all really ripped off each other really well. Um, it'd also be great if you guys feel comfortable to share where folks can find you or reach you um, or, and the accelerator program or company that you represent.